So with this formal introduction, I think I can straight plunge into the conversation with the writer who has given the unconsoled world the ministry of utmost happiness and of course the god of small things. Now, Arundhati is a writer who has always lent her voice to the voiceless, to the oppressed and um, you know, people who are in, in the lower strata of the society. So I think at a time when we see free speech being stifled, I think it's all the more relevant and crucial that we listen to Arunthati Roy. Welcome Arunthati, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks Anjuna, I should, I should just quickly say that, I mean we said this last evening too, that one of the things I've said is that I, do, I actually don't lend my voice to the voiceless because I don't believe there's any such thing as the voiceless but only the deliberately suppressed or the preferably unheard. So I, I don't see myself as a representative of anybody, but as a person who lives in this world and doesn't represent, but includes the people who live here on this world with me. Okay, that's a great take to begin with. Um, I don't think you've always said that you know fiction is not just a genre for you. It is more like your universe. So when you wrote God of Small Things, and then you, when you came up with your second novel, it took almost twenty years. So in those twenty years, you know the whole world has changed around you. You know India has changed its politics, its people. You know there was no social media at that time. Even literature has changed. So I, I would like to find out, you know, when you came back to your personal universe, was it intact there? Or all these chaos in the outside universe completely altered it? Well, obviously, you know, um, after writing The God of Small Things, I didn't, uh, I didn't think of myself as somebody who needs to just keep writing or doing the same thing. And yes, the world has changed. and. Um, perhaps I have changed, I hope I've changed, it's important to change, you know. And the, the 20 years of walking, fighting, arguing, jumping into that massive stream of conversations that go on in this country, being part of it, uh, the reason that I then the Ministry of Utmost Happiness began to build itself up in me because I began to feel that the complexity of the things that I was hearing were outside of just merely a political argument, you know? So, for example, although many people think that, um, they think of the ministry as somehow a a distillation of a lot of the political writing I've done. It's, it isn't that, because for instance, a, a great section of the book has to do with Kashmir, looked at in different ways, you know, from the eyes of an intelligence officer, from the, through the eyes of a strange woman called Tilotama, through the eyes of Musa, who's a militant there, and in truth, I haven't really written much nonfiction about Kashmir because I knew that the only way that I could really say what I wanted to is through fiction. Because, because it's not just about torture reports or human rights violations or statistics of blindings or whatever. It's, it's about how the air is full of terror. It's about negotiations that go on in very complex ways about collaborators, fighters, double agents, triple agents, children, uh, all kinds of things, you know? So I didn't, I mean, it's not that I went to Kashmir with this idea that, oh, let me write a book or let me write a project. No, I mean, I'm not someone who, who, puts a, who has a project and then goes to fulfill it. It's, it, 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 it's something that began happening inside me as I lived my life, you know. So way back, like maybe 14 years ago when I first started to go to Kashmir, the first thing I started to do was to write what is in the ministry 
for the Kashmir, Kashmiri English alphabet, because I suddenly saw that this politic of an occupied people has a whole different vocabulary, you know? Uh, you know, I was quite intrigued because in this last 20 years, you know, you have you've walked with the comrades, you, you know, you've spent time with Maoists and, you know, you have been in Kashmir and you've kind of rubbed shoulders with them, seen all these, you know, in, in close quarters. So as a journalist myself, you know, who has been to these conflict zones, you know, where you see the, the most hopeless places, can you explain how is it different from that a writer processed all these information and these you know, sites that you see, how is it different from journalists? And there are so many reportage coming out, you know, and TV channels are all over the place. So for the public, how is it different from how would a journalist portray a problem and a writer like you would do that? Um, I think the fundamental difference per perhaps is that uh, I don't go there with an assignment in mind, you know? I don't go there thinking I have to do a neutral reportage or someone has commissioned me to tell this story or to cover this. I go there out of a kind of personal curiosity and I go there uh, knowing that I'm also part of this world, you know? So, um, I go there with, pre you know, it's, it's in a way, I, I, I remember long ago after, at the time I wrote The God of Small Things, I, it was of course in the late 90s, you know, and, the, and, and, and one had begun to see the, the effect of this new neoliberal economics in the cities, in the villages, you just see these massive, displacement going on. You could see the cities filling up with, with people who were not wanted. The villages, they were being pushed out of. The cities, they were not wanted. And at that time, my own fortunes were, were rising, you know. I mean, I was, I was the author of a book that was selling millions of copies, and I began to wonder what does it mean to be a writer. And you suddenly had this, this money gushing at you. Yeah, and what does it mean to be in this world, to be a writer? What do you do with that money also, you know? Like, it, how do you use it in solidarity, not in charity, you know? All these things uh, were very much part of thinking of what it means to be a writer traveling, trying to understand, and knowing that I could see at the same time that literature was becoming a part of the market. Writers such as myself were almost, I mean, there was a great invitation to me to be this product, you know, the space of the new aggressive nuclear Hinduizing India. So I, I stepped off that, you know, and then as I started to walk. I began to be part of other worlds. And to me, that is my greatest reward and my greatest royalty that I was, am, not was, I am therefore invited into places uh, that others are not, you know? only because of what I have written before, only because there's a certain trust that's created, you know? So, I mean, whether it's in South Africa, or whether it's in Poland, or whether it's in Bastar, or whether it's in Kashmir, writing takes me into the heart of things in ways which nothing else could. And that gives me such happiness to know that the word, the written word, in today's age of videos and movies and WhatsApp and fake news and all of that, the written word still holds such a place in people's hearts, you know? Even to see all of, all of you here uh, at this festival, not just for me, but for other writers, it's a very wonderful feeling. You know, I, I, I really love to see you all here.
it's, 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 it's amazing. It's a fantastic crowd also today. Arunta, you've always maintained that, you know, the, the real thing to be a writer is to be unpopular. And I think you have done a good job about it because, you know, there is a section in India that thinks that writers like Arundhati Roy belongs to the Tukde Tukde gang of India, you know, people who wants to break the country. But, you know, because you deal with both fiction and non-fiction, you've written all these essays, uh, you know, which has taken on political causes, does it give you the kind of flexibility and that bandwidth to be a popular writer across the world, the most venerated writer, I must say, and also at the same time, an unpopular critic. Isn't that a fine balance that you maintain? That's a good observation. You know, what, what I said is that, right, uh, you know, years ago, years ago, when I, uh, when I first went into the Narmada Valley and I met people in the valley, the activists, Medha, all the other activists, and, uh, you know, we were, I was going to write The Greater Common Good. And I told Medha, I said, Medha, when I write it, there'll be a great attempt to divide us. There'll be a great attempt to try and uh, uh, make out that I'm somehow claiming to be an activist or a leader of this movement. And I want you to know that I have no interest in being anything but the writer that tells this story. You know, so let's just ignore all the troublemaking in the middle. And often people ask me, you know, I mean, often people try to confuse the fact that uh, a person, a writer who writes politically is some kind of a leader. And I keep saying, that can't happen because I'm the opposite of a politician, you know? A politician, and I respect it, you know, that a politician goes among the people and says, please vote for me. That's the opposite of what I do. I, I say, I want to understand, and I might say things that don't please you. I'm not asking you to vote for me. I'm just saying I need to live freely. I need to write freely. And that might not be popular. My job is not to be popular. You know? It's not, it's not, it's not that I'm longing to be unpopular, but that is not my brief. You know, that I've got to say something that majority people will agree with or that will get this many likes on Facebook or that many retweets. That's not my brief, it might happen. It might happen that uh, when I write, uh, it does happen that, you know, I do happen to be a writer that is widely read, but that's not the place I start from, you know? So you're not in the business of pleasing people, uh, but you know, it's not easy to be a critic, especially in the current political climate that we see. You know, but you still have been a vocal critic of the current government and the right wing. And the past government. And, and the past <laughs> too, <laughs> yes. But you know, what is happening now is that any of these voices of dissent, it's getting suppressed. And there have been instances where these voices have been silenced, as in the case of Gauri Lankesh. And I think that was a watershed moment for India's free speech that a journalist who, you know, who voiced her uh, 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 criticism was gunned down in daylight. How did that affect you personally? What kind of impact did that leave it in you? Well, it was, it was, uh, it was horrifying for me, you know, because just, just, uh, I mean, I still have Gauri's message on my phone days before this happened where she, she uh, just told me uh, her last message was to me was I loved, 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 loved the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, you know, and there's a picture of her holding it up. And so obviously it, I mean, just personally it was, it was horrible. And, you know, 
what is happening in this country is that uh, censorship has been outsourced to the mob. And so we, we live in times where free speech is not being censored by a censor board, or oh, that is happening too. But as we see now, you know, any group of people who have political clout can decide how they wish to be represented, what their history should be. They have the right to burn down cinema halls. They have the right to kill people. They have the right to what they did to Perumal Murugan. They have the right to, you know, uh, more or less rampage through the world of ideas with clubs and frighten people, you know. So uh, it's true that, you know, um, right now there's a sort of slight opening that is giving some of us some hope that the people of this country are standing up, maybe not for the reasons that someone like myself uh, was so shocked when this regime came to power, you know, uh, a regime that has really proudly almost owned up to massacres and cow lynching and all of that, but for various economic reasons maybe now we may hope to see some sort of change. But I think the danger will not pass even if this regime is not in power because all these institutions have been compromised. And people who are going around killing people, even killing ordinary people, you know, uh, and let's say it didn't begin with, I mean, uh, like look at people like Binayak Sen who were jailed even in the Congress regime, you know. So there is a atmosphere that is very, very dangerous. And in that atmosphere, we don't know what we are fighting or who we are fighting or what will suddenly come at us, you know? So surely when I was writing the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, especially a few years ago, I really had to tell myself that write it how you want to write it and then keep it in your drawer. Don't publish it, you know? But write it how you want to write it. I wasn't aware that once I finish writing it, the writer's ego will not allow that book to stay in the drawer, you know? Of course, I'm not going to keep it in my drawer. There's a kind of crazy uh, courage that comes from wanting it to be in the world. But then you have to be strategic, you know? So I literally, for, for me and my publishers, it was released like a military strategy, you know. I decided, I mean, it was a risk, but I decided, let it come out in India. I won't do any events. I won't, because I didn't even want it to come out to some cheap political kind of uh, polemic, you know. So I just, I just, I mean, fortunately, it, 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 it was translated, it's been translated into 49 languages, so I just traveled a lot. I went from country to country, I spoke, thousands of people would come, and that way I was reinforcing myself. Then let it, let it be a big fight, and let it be on my terms, you know? Um, so, how we live in these times as writers, as filmmakers, as politicians, or just as ordinary people, is going to get more and more complex because of uh, you know, because of fake news, because of rumors. I mean, just before the book came out, we had that moment where a piece of fake news that came out in Pakistan about me had uh, Par Par Paresh Rawal saying, you know, let's use her as a human shield, shield in Kashmir. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so, so, so for me, I would never, when people say brave, I say, no, I'm not brave. I, I uh, think it's very stupid to underestimate the climate in which we live. And yet we live, we write. It's like a dance, you know. You have to know or you have to risk it. You have to say something. You have to retreat. 
you have to step sideways, you have to change, um, you have to change it up, you know, do different things and try and try and say what you want. I mean, after all, let's not forget that in the Soviet Union, I mean, there was censorship beyond anything we can even imagine. And yet, such great literature, such great poetry came out of there, you know? So there is never a situation in which people are not up against it in history. And um, I think we, as writers, will manage to say what we want to say and say it beautifully, but think about it carefully, you know? Okay. But, you know, all these years, uh, you know, with these kind of contradictions that you spoke about when you want to say what you want to say, but at the same time there is this kind of, um, you know, fear. You never, you, you, you continue to live in India, right? You live in Delhi. Was there a moment, any time, that you wanted to move out? Did you ever feel threatened? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there was just one moment when that happened, and that wasn't, that wasn't wanting to move out, but uh, at the time when I had just nearly finished writing the ministry, I mean, I just knew that there was just weeks in which to finish it, and that happened to coincide with the time when the whole unrest was starting in JNU. I know Umar Khalid was, I think he's here, or maybe just left, but, you know, he was being completely defamed on TV, Kanhaya Kumar had been arrested, these mobs were entering the courtrooms, uh, there, there, and there were people on television who, who were literally saying, you know, yeah, these, these, these people have to be silenced, but what about the person who's the woman who wrote about the parliament attack, who wrote about Kashmir, who wrote about uh, you know, Gujarat, why is she not, yeah. you know, I mean, clear, uh, the, and, and I mean, I would go to, I remember one night going up the st dark staircase to, to have dinner with a friend, and I could hear the TV on in the flat, and this guy shouting, ki, koi bhi ho, arundati roy bhi ho, hum usko nahi chhodenge, you know? And, and my vulnerability was, only because I was trying to protect this work that I had been working on for 10 years. And that night, I got to say, I lost my nerve. And I just, I just got on a flight and went to London with my books. And I thought, I'll just finish it, you know? And, and then I just froze. I, I remember just sitting in the restaurant, in the breakfast, place of this hotel and I mean a friend came to see me and I just couldn't speak I was just crying I said do you know what are they doing to this this country you know they are just they're just they're just shattering it you know just breaking it and and within three or four days I I realized that I can't be that person who has run away you know so I just came straight back and I finish. And yeah. that is why we have the Ministry of Utmost <laughs> Happiness. But in that context, you know, I would like to ask you, this mob-induced or the majoritarian-induced censorship that you spoke about, it is kind of dictating the literary landscape that we have. And, you know, we have writers like Arundhati Roy, but we, we also have writers who chose to crawl when they are being asked to bend. I mean, there are editors, there are journalists who do that, there are writers who do that. Writers, actors, uh, you know. Actors, people, every, everyone, uh, yeah. yeah. Everybody very, is very social. sad. Yeah, mm. so not everybody has the nerve to stand up. So how do you think it is altering this literary landscape? How is it affecting a writer? You know, even when he is conceiving, you know, that first seed of a story that he wants to write. Is that a problem? Yeah, I think there are two factors that are, uh, that are affecting the landscape. And of course, there are many, but I'm just saying 
on the one hand, there is the market, you know, and that, in a way, historically has, has blunted the impact of literature in ways that are very sad, you know, that uh, publishers and booksellers and writers now just look at numbers, you know. So, like what I said, you know, uh, people, people who might be writing something beautiful but which is not marketable or not a bestseller or not a seller even are not being published. Whereas, historically, this was not the case, you know. There were, there were uh, always publishers who would stand by literature that they believed in. And now publishers look at books as if they are selling soap or mosquito repellent, you know. It's really very, very sad. Uh, recently, I mean, just a few days ago, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness have been translated into Urdu and Hindi. And you know, uh, what a, I mean, Urdu, of course, is a, a, a very, very integral part of the understanding of the conflict of Urdu, Hindi, all that is very much part of the book. And you know, there are no Urdu publishers in India anymore except vanity publishers, you know, people who take money from writers for their books to be published. Because there's an attempt to kind of take away the oxygen from that language. Um, so that's one, one, one form of change in the literary landscape. And the other, as you said, is this fear of the mob, this fear of this current regime, this fear of not just the regime, but this, this very, very complex society which is now, you know, wh where people, communities, castes are censoring each other. Now, the danger of that is that, I've, I mean, I've said this, I've said this many times, you know, like, perhaps the greater danger than fascism that we face is cretinism, you know? Cretinism, of course, is the foundation of, uh, of fascism. Just a few days ago, you saw what happened at the uh, National uh, Science Congress. You had the vice chancellor of a university who calls himself a scientist, saying, I've just disproved Einstein's theory. I've just written a letter to Stephen Hawkins saying that your understanding of uh, dark matter and the black hole is rubbish, and we should re rename magnetic uh, waves as Modi waves. I mean, come on, you know, like, where are we going, you know? So this form of cretinism, this form of mediocrity, this form of absolute idiocy is what we are up against now. And uh, it's so, so sad. It's so sad, you know. You know, Arundhati, it's not just in India because, you know, we live in very strange times. You know, we, we have an American president who's put his country at a gunpoint to build a wall to ward off the migrants. And yet, you know, across Europe, you know, the whole refugee crisis, there is, there is this barbed wires being, uh, you know, set up so that you divide people. But, you know, there are these walls within ourselves, the impenetrable ones of caste, of creed, of, uh, you know, of uh, regionalism. And, you know, as, as writers approach their creative work, how would you think that would affect, you know, the formation of those characters? And how do you think, through your work, you can decommunalize the society? You know, this regime could go in 2019, but the poison which is spread, it will persist. You know, the solidification of this majoritarianism, populism is there. How would writers deal with that? Well, um, you know, the point is that writers are like plumbers or carpenters, or I mean, some of them service that very communalism, that very casteism, you know. So writers are not a separate, homogenous species with uh, lofty motives, you know. So it depends on 
obviously what kind of a writer you are, you know. And uh, the truth is that as everything, you know, whether it is pedagogy, whether it is syllabus, whether it is history writing, whether it is the, the industry of medicine, all of it now is being controlled by the form, by a form of capital which makes a conflict of interest inevitable, you know? So until we understand that, I mean, we can spend our lives criticizing the media, the corporate media, the corporate agenda, but until you understand the structures, the economic structures of those institutions, the caste structure of that institution. You know, I think we are a society that has, uh, that is incredibly hypocritical, incredibly hypocritical, who will not face up to what we have constructed socially. I mean, there are, there are societies, all societies are unequal, but caste is something in which you actually worship inequality, in which you institutionalize inequality. So until we face up and correct things in our own history, just in the telling of the story to begin with, because I do believe that human society, one of the fundamental cellulose in our cellular structure is which story we choose to believe and which story we all subscribe to, which then makes us a community. And so that is something we have to, uh, we have, I mean, those of us who do see the discrepancies or the untruths that we have subscribed to so far, have to work towards correcting them. You know, in your, in your book, you have created this, uh, this Jannat guest house. Is that your la-la land, your dream world, a utopia that you would like to see in the outside universe? You know, there's a transgender, there's a Muslim, everybody living, all these shattered souls living in complete harmony, you know, evolving, giving to each other. So is that the utopia that, that you wanted to project to the outside world? Well, the Janet Guest House is a... Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's a utopia, but certainly it's, I, I didn't create it as a utopia. You know, it happened that all the characters in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, starting with Anjum, who used to be Aftab, have uh, these borders running through them, incendiary borders running through them. Anjum has the border of gender, but she's a, Shia Muslim, born a boy, who becomes Anjum. And in these times, in fact, her, um, the fact that she's a Muslim is much more dangerous than the fact that she is a trans person, you know? So she, in fact, gets caught up in the Gujarat massacre and survives. She gets caught up because she's a Muslim, but survives because uh. she's a hijra, you know? But there is Saddam Hussein who has the border of caste and religious conversion. There's Musa who has a national border. There's Garson Hobart, an intelligence officer whose half of him is the state that can wait, that, that can put every cruelty in some kind of historical context and wait. And half of him is this drunken sort of lover, a complete failure. Who, who can look at himself with a lot of humor and so on. There's Tilotama, a strange woman, also with the border it's, that's of That's yourself, uh, right? She's There's a lot of autobiographical <laughs> elements when you call her Tilo strange. Tilotama, she's the child of Velita and Amu, in my head, from the God of Small Things. But, uh, so when the Anjum, Anjum who, who leaves, who's unable to, collect herself, you know, after her experience in the killings of Gujarat, she moves into a graveyard where she, she suffers from this wild and inconsolable grief and then slowly gathers herself 
and then begins to build a guest house in the graveyard. And of course, you have the Jannat, which means paradise, guest house, in a Delhi graveyard. Meanwhile, you have in the Jannat of Kashmir, covered with other graveyards. And so one is talking about a situation where the dead and the living are in constant conversation. And when I, <laughs> I mean, I actually suddenly thought about it. If you look at who lives in the Jannat guest house, who dies and who's buried in that graveyard, what are the prayers that are said from the Fateha to the recitation of Shakespeare to the singing of the Internationale, in a way, it is the revolution that we want, you know? And, and you know, when you're talking about fiction as truth, fiction requires a lot of imagination, unbridled imagination. But because you are a political writer and this novel is essentially very political, how do you strike that balance between the fiction and the reality? I think the, the reason I, I said fiction is truth is because it's not something that I said. It's something that Cellini said, you know? And it's a mistake to think that there is a, there is a sort of polar oppositeness between fiction and fact, between fiction and truth. Fiction is a writer's deepening of their understanding of what goes on, even science fiction, you know? So that it isn't necessarily, it's just a different way of deepening things, you know? So, for instance, like I said, if you, if you look at Kashmir, there is a part in the, min I'm just giving you an example, there's a part of, in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness where there is a captain in the Indian Army called Amrit Singh, who, who's gone wild, you know, in the sense that he has been used by the state to do things which are absolutely not something, not things that should be done. And then he has taken the license to do many more things. At one point, he goes to visit a Kashmiri family. And uh, they are sitting down and eating and drinking and you know, he's very jolly and he takes off his belt and he puts his gun down there among the cakes and the biscuits. And, and there is a conflict between him and the son of the house, Musa. And at some point, Amrik Singh gets up to go and he pretends to forget his gun. You know, and then when the family says, gives him the gun, he says, well, imagine if I had forgotten it here even I wouldn't have been able to save you if a coordinate search operation found it. Now, leaving a gun among the biscuits is not a human rights violation, you know? But it tells you, in a way, only fiction can tell you how the air is seeded with terror. Or, let's say, uh, uh, a captain who calls himself Captain John Baz goes to a village and one of the characters in the book is called Gulrez. He's slightly, uh, you know, he's a mutt, what the Kashmiris call a mutt, you know, slightly special person who uh, has this very, very precious relationship with a rooster, with a kuankori, we calls Sultan. He loves Sultan. They both have a little universe of their own. And Jan Baz goes to the village for no big reason, just goes to lecture the villagers about, you know, how to behave and what to do and boast a little and terrorize them routinely. He has this uh, Alsatian dog. And as he's leaving, he just says, fetch. And the dog goes and, and kills Sultan. It devastates raise. It terrorizes the villagers because it's just an application of unreasonable terror that you cannot anticipate. This can't make it into an Amnesty International report. 
but this can tell you what's going on there, you know? So that's what I mean when I say fiction is true. When we listen to her, we can only hope that her universe of fiction remains intact so that we can, you know, enjoy the beauty of it. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions coming your way. There's an eager crowd there. But as a journalist, I can't uh, let go of that question. I don't think you have hit the headlines today for your talk on Gandhi yesterday. And you know, you have written an introduction for the annihilation of caste where you know, you've called out Gandhi as a racist and a casteist. And two days ago, you know, we had a discussion with, uh, with author Ramachandra Guha where you know, in his book, he's elaborated a lot on how Gandhi has evolved you know, into this Mahatma that, he, that we all acknowledge. You know, and I'm sure you, through your writings and through your speeches, you have quoted a lot on Gandhi's writings from South Africa to until 1945, where, you know, the casteism and racism is so evident in your arguments. Let's not get, go there because you have spoken at length yesterday. But what I would like to ask you is, you know, you have dedicated this book to the unconsoled of the world. But in today's world, Mahatma Gandhi is a flicker of hope for millions. He is a soothing balm for all these shattered souls. Why should we deny the masses of Gandhi, of the Mahatma? Well, I, I uh, disagree, you know, because when you use something as a balm, there has to be something uh, um, historically accurate about that balm, you know? And today, uh, if I just want you, if I just tell you a simple thing, you go to the house of any truly oppressed, truly unconsoled, truly disenfranchised in many ways person in this country, whose portrait will you find there? And so, Rajinikanth. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there weren't brilliant things about Gandhi. I'm not trying to say that, uh, you know, you have to just uh, tarnish him in every way. But I, I think that we do need to stop this hypocrisy, you know. I do think that we need to face things for what they are. I mean, we're not children, right? We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can say what's good, what's bad. We don't have to fall down and worship at the feet of a myth that's completely untrue. This is what I say. Now I think I'm open to, uh, going to open the floor for questions. So please raise your hands. I think there's a mic there. Ma'am, uh, I have uh, some things to ask, uh, mainly I hope you will uh, reply. Uh, in the current era and uh, recent period, we are witnessing uh, as a uh, you are from a literature uh, writer and all, so many writers uh, or activists are being uh, sent into prison. Uh, in the, by saying the recent date, they had uh, wrote something against the government policies or like that. So as an activist and as well as a writer, What's your opinion about that? And also, my second question is, like in India... Can the excuse me, can we stick to one question so that we give yes, equal... one more, one more. I want to know her reply from that. That's why. In India, the marginalized community, including women, are facing lots of issues today. So, uh, margi marginalized the community... Marginalized community? Sorry. Including women are uh, facing lots of issues. Uh, in democracy, we say that the, there is a talk uh, point for everyone. But is it, uh, is it obstacle or is it uh, destroyed by uh, some majoritarian views like uh, some fascist forces? What's your saying about it? Well, uh, thank you for asking this question. You know, very close friends of mine are in prison right now. And uh, all those who have been called urban Naxals after the Bhima Koregaon meet of last year, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Sai Baba, who is paralyzed from his waist down, who is, I hope he'll live, you know, he's in such great 
and grievous danger, sentenced to life imprisonment for what? For standing up against Operation Green Hunt, which was an operation, of course, called by the Congress regime against the poorest people in this country. Uh, these are things that are part of what is going on. You know, the fact is that whether it is the Hindu nationalism or whether it's market fundamentalism, whether it has been the Congress or the BJP, both have used a kind of rhetoric to become a police state, you know? So in fact, truthfully, there has not been a day since 1947 when the Indian army has not been deployed against, quote, unquote, its own people in this country. Not a single day, you know? And today you are seeing the army, the densest military occupation in Kashmir, where the army is turning into a sort of administrative force, a bloated administrative force in Kashmir. The police in Chhattisgarh are turning into an army. We are living in an age of electronic surveillance. The laws that the government is passing now on the digital front are absolutely terrifying. The Aadhaar card is something that is actually a means of surveillance. And, I mean, speaking in a, in a state which has been ruled by communists, I want to say that we are the whole world, not just now, not just us, we are on the verge of becoming a world in which, because of robotics, because of artificial intelligence, human labor is going to become increasingly irrelevant, human societies are not going to be required to participate in economic activity. So what do we do when workers are no longer needed, when the proletariat is no longer required? You know, It's a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, Raghuram Rajan's report recently said that India needs to create 12 million jobs a year Nowhere near that. I mean, what is happening is the opposite. GST demonetization is, 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 is kicking the poorer people out of the economic activity. Privatization of education is pushing even the few OBC Dalit ad, uh, Adivasi students that did get a foothold into universities. You know? So we, are, we have to understand that this moment is not just about getting the BJP out of power. That too, that's very important. But we've got to understand what we are up against now. We really do. No? It's my Make your question precise. We have time limitation. My name is Saman. So, good afternoon. My question is to you that you have read about the, I think you have read about the Supreme Court verdict that has changed Kerala to a war zone, the entry of women to Shabrimala. So as a woman writer and a social activist, what is your opinion about this Supreme Court verdict, willing or unwilling? I'll tell you what. My uh, formula is that anything that happens within one year of a major election, including Supreme Court verdict, are all about the election. <laughs> Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, what is your opinion on the art versus artist debate that's been going on for a long time? It's got more scrutiny now. So should the art be separated from the artist? See, I don't have... Uh, I don't have any rules for all this, you know. I mean, that is up to those who want to be commentators. I am somebody who uh, writes what I write. And once I've written it, while I'm doing it, I cannot be separated from it. Once I've done it, it belongs to the world and it can do what it wants, you know. I can't legislate about it. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, 
Ma'am, it's a great thing uh, asking question to you because we have been reading about you in G our GK books. From class 6 to 8, you have been dominating you our GK books. You're making me feel very old, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> ma'am, I'm, uh, ma I'm just in first year of BTEC, so ma'am, it's been five or six years. You have been dominating our GK books, I must say that. Ma'am, my question is that, uh, that ma'am, in the war of uh, left and right, con uh, conservative and uh, liberals, uh, uh, friction and non-friction, why have been repeatedly the army is being dragged? Ma'am, the, the, ma they are not distinguishing between who is a, a criminal, uh, between shooting. They don't discriminate when there is floods in Kashmir, when there is floods in Kerala, who to save and who not to save. Then why they have been dragged? Yeah, they could be misused by the power, but they are not doing anything by themselves. It is not a tyrannical rule in this country. I think you must go and ask, stand up and say this in Kashmir and ask for them to reply. Ma'am, they have been saved but uh, in the floods as well by the Indian Army itself. You have to go there and ask them what happened in the flood. Ma'am, we didn't see any other ka their Kashmiri uh, heroes to be there. Let's not make this into an argument. We will pass the mic uh, to the next question. Sorry ma'am, but I have respect yeah. for you. <laughs> Fine, I respect you too. <laughs> That's what's lovely about us, right? Hi, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. So I want to ask about your book. So I heard you talk once say that the characters of the ministry actually came and lived in your house and suffocated you into writing the novel. And as I read the novel, I felt a lot of pent-up uh, frustration, anger, and... Uh, irritation at the things happening in Kashmir, in Delhi, in Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh. So in a way, are these two the two sides of the same coin? So I think you uh, may have misunderstood. I was talking about how real, how real the fiction is for me, you know, so that Anjum and Saddam and Garson and all of them just began to live with me, although no one else could see them. And, and the, uh, and, and I don't think that uh, you can write a book of fiction which is just about pent-up anger and frustration. You know, it's also about humor, it's also about poetry, it's also about love, uh, the strangest kinds of love, many different kinds of love, you know. So honestly, you know, when people say that the God of Small Things was lyrical, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness is political, I don't understand, because what people do is, they try to, uh, like for, in, for instance, what could be more political than the, than the, the, the love between Velita and Amu in The God of Small Things. It had me in court on a criminal charge for corrupting public morality for 10 years. Every time the judge would come and say, every time the this case comes before me, I get chest pains. <laughs> and then it, he would postpone it, you know? The ministry, uh, and again, I'll say this is what fiction does. All of us are gradually being trained to think of what happens around us in subject. I write about caste, my specialization is Kashmir, so and so deals with de gender, so-and-so deals with development, so-and-so deals with X, Y, and Z. But this is all the air we breathe. This is what we breathe in, and this is what we breathe out. So, in fact, to not write about these things is an act of some very complicated yoga posture, you know, where you're trying not to see what's sitting right in front of you. And what fiction does by connecting all of this, by accepting that this is the air we breathe, it gives you the radical understanding of how these things are connected to each other, you know? And that is why I say fiction, uh, fiction is a universe because it accepts and breathes. Like for me, I cannot think of writing a book which is a manifesto pretending to be a story I cannot think of writing a book where X, Y, Z is in the background and then the foreground is this. In the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, the background becomes the foreground. History kicks the door in at two in the morning. You, 
you, you deal head on with the atmosphere in which you live without being scared. I mean, to me, a fiction writer should be as, as easy about intimacy and love as with violence, as with betrayal, as with irrigation, as with displacement, as with whatever the complex complexities are that we live in, you know? Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm very glad you mentioned about the human labor being redundant, and that is what I want to ask you about. So I, I read a book by Yuval Noah Harari called Sapiens, and where he calls, where he says that by 2050, you know, human labor, humans will not be un underemployed, they'll be unemployable. And I read this book by Arun Bastani, uh, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, and stuff like that. I was very glad that those books are coming now. So, uh, do you really think that, yes, the market is a beast and no social democracy can contain it because it is destroying all the institutions, it is destroying human labor itself, the proletariat. Do you really think that Marx is back in our story and there's a very bright future where we can really see that all these automation could be used for people and not for exploiting them? What are your views? I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Because even today, you know, the, the place where human society fails, capitalist society fails, is in distribution. I mean, we know that there is money, but it's not evenly distributed. There are goods, they are not evenly distributed. There is food, they're not evenly distributed. So there is a problem in assuming that power will be uh, in a few hands and then the surplus will be distributed to people, you know. So I do think that young people have to find a way in which to assert that uh, they will not allow this further and further concentration of power, you know. Well, I, I hope so, but not, it won't necessarily be I don't think it'll necessarily be the revolution that Marx thought about, you know? But it has, because I think conceptually we are in, you know, uh, there was a period of industrialization and mechanization where human beings used machines to increase surplus. But now, the machines are replacing human beings, you know? There is a, a, a debate about what is human. So these are things we have to think about, you know. And I do feel very nervous about uh, the fact that there are uh, chemical weapons programs, smart nuke programs, uh, programs where people are thinking about targeting specific populations, you know. Because that will be how eventually climate change and so on might be dealt with. So. We have to start thinking very, very fast. We would love to hear more from you, Arundhati, but uh, for lack of time, I'll have to wrap it up. And I would like to thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank and you. And thank you for being a wonderful audience.